Okay, welcome back to cloud computing and big data. The topic of today is uh, lecture two, machine learning models in clouds. And we will have a very moderate introduction to machine learning uh, with really focusing more on the emphasis of using clouds. And essentially lecture two is directly related to your assignment one and has also deep connection with lecture three, where we will learn more about Apache Spark and how that works in the clouds, especially with Microsoft Azure. Let, let me go uh, before we enter the material of lecture two shortly what we had the last time, uh, which was really about the foundations of cloud computing. We learned that it has roots in high performance computing. It has roots from high throughput computing that are both a little bit different, but both computing paradigms that stand the test of time and will be always remain. We have also seen that um, essentially, if you break down um, a cloud, you can say it's still hardware, it's still storage, network, so software, things we know, right? From normal software, there's nothing magic about it. The only, let's say, key centric aspect of it is that it's paid services. Usually, of course, if you have academic crowds, uh, then basically the service oriented aspect is usually free or given by your academic collaboration. If you go to the many vendors you see here downstairs that are listed again, because we had some examples in the last lecture of, you know, what are real clouds out there? What do you see daily if you operate in a company? And I'm sure most of you or many of you will have already contact with many of those uh, given maybe Facebook or even Google Docs here um, when we, you know, already are students and you now interacting with students, for instance, as professors with students uh, in the area of Microsoft 365. So you see that essentially it has gone through every part of our life. So when you go to great scope, it puts things on Amazon Web Services. We see that they are basically also interconnect, so you can use different clouds together. And the beauty in all of this is that you have essentially three benefits that we said. And when you think about you have your little laptop and basically, let's say you have a startup company you create and your laptop is there. So when you want to have real big computing done, there's no upfront costs, right? And this relates to the discussion section here in the lecture in Canvas. So firstly, you say, um, you have no, you know, upfront costs. You can just start. You just swipe your credit card, you go. If you have a, let's say, company, you need to buy, you have to equip a computing room, you have to find out what the best pricing. In academics, it's even more harder. You have to do some tenders to really see um, who get the best offers. So essentially, no upfront cost. Then you have to think that, of course, once I do this, I have a kind of um, contract with myself if I rent the services. Um, the that I want to put in um, in the cloud, you essentially have no real termination time of your service. You would say uh, basically you could just stop every day because what do you think is the most benefit today in cloud? We talked about this and the pricing models. This is pay what you use, right? And and this is by far interesting because we talked about the scalability issue, which is the most crucial one that every company faces, even in academics before, you know, big large conferences, you face the same problem that suddenly you need lots of IT and after a couple of months, you don't need that anymore. So you, this would be idle, it, you know, need to be sold again or whatever you do with it, but essentially it stays unused. And to get rid of this problem, and as I said, also the other ones, no upfront costs, no termination time, clouds really had a big breakthrough in, in really, nurturing this paradigm of pay what you use and only pay what you use. Of course, this term is loaded. And uh, basically, if you go through all the lectures of this course, you will realize that. So you pay a little bit for storage, doesn't sound so much. You pay a little bit for computing, it doesn't sound so much. And then you want to upload, download things in the cloud, the networking in and out costs a little bit. Ah, oh, that's okay. But in the end, if you then start with having a professional app that scales to many, many CPUs, like we have seen with Angry Bird as an example, then you quickly see that this all adds up. And of course, this is an important aspect um, of the clouds again, 
that, you know, basically um, this is how they're financing itself, right? Amazon is an interesting model because it also is shopping at the same time, but the backbone of doing the computing and the shopping is actually realized and at the same time also offered as a service and which has now become over the last years, uh, decades, we should say now, basically, um, to real interesting, let's say, a pr cloud provider that is, let's say, one with Google and maybe with Microsoft, one of the most leading ones in cloud services. And you will see if we have some, you know, future, le for future lectures about that, there are lots of services and all operate the same way. You have a paid service and you have some requests and they interact. Another theme of last lecture was the big data is real. So we said like big data sounds like volume, sounds like lots of lots of data, exabytes, petabytes. But we also said like actually in a way you could deal with that today. So storage is getting cheaper. Um, there are just two problems with it. Firstly is when you have, you know, a lot of big data, but it coming on at an, an enormous velocity, right? Here was one of the key examples in science and engineering right now, where one petabyte is expected to flow every 20 seconds. So that is a problem. Uh, having a couple of petabytes uh, stored at a large computing center like we have in Jülich or around the world, really, that's not a problem. But having to digest, so to speak, one petabyte at 20 seconds pace is a problem, especially if you also want to analyze it, right? And for this, we have learned there are new big data analytics tools which are really able to scale out. And this is just beautiful for the cloud paradigm where you see above there on the right hand side, you have an Amazon EC2 elastic compute cloud. So you can always expand or reduce according to your needs. And this reflects a little bit like you start with small data, accumulate more data to big data, and your cloud is essentially growing with you. And this is of course very interesting. And when you now think about how that shaped machine learning uh, and so forth, we will have this lecture today about it. And uh, the final aspect of last lecture, which is also really an important lecture because it captures the basics is really also the innovation that was not only in the multi-core processors that you may all know and all have in your laptops. Today, it's also really the many core GPUs. So the graphical chips that are used for general purpose processing, which play a big role in deep learning, which we will then explore in lecture six and lecture seven, really driving the big lear deep learning aspects that we see today in the media. But let us come now to the interesting next step. So once you have big data, you want to make it to use, you want to work on it. And one of the big areas how to make, you know, take advantage of big data in the clouds is really machine learning, deep learning models. Now, this is not a machine learning course. Um, that's why it's essentially saying we use it as an application and we keep the mathematics to a moderate degree. However, in this first, let's say, lecture about machine learning, I give you some fundamentals in the first part of this uh, lecture to just understand essentially the basics. We will talk about the general learning methods and also think about what is really classification, you know, what, what that, that means. So we have a very simple application of flowers where we also will understand the training and testing process of using data sets in practice. And then towards the end of the first part, we will also think about more advanced models. So we start with a very linear in very simple linear perception model, which was in the 50s already invented. And we end with a more sophisticated model called logistic regression, which uh, captures, uh, you know, nonlinear relationships in the data and so forth. And you see, essentially, one of the examples is directly linked to assignment one. So it's also very beneficial to stay on the call to understand what machine learning is. This also gives me the possibility to say, if you're really interested in this topic, please take a machine learning course. I mean, first of all, at the University of Iceland, we have courses in machine learning from my colleagues. Um, that is very interesting. Of course, Coursera and other courses are there around as well for machine learning. And uh, this is really just an introduction. And we come through all the subsequent lectures every now and then back to machine learning, um, but also, as I said, more or less to the moderate degree here. Now, the second part in machine learning in clouds is really meaning we will pick one concrete example. Of course, we could now go through all the different ones, Google Clouds, Amazon, and so forth, but you should 
get some takeaway message here really and know how it really works. So we will have a so-called stepwise approach of this. And this will come back again and again and was already introduced in lecture one where we talked about how we have to actually uh, go to the cloud, what we have to do, checking subscription models, and then think about some scalable computing entity, which is here the Apache Spark cluster that we will introduce. Then um, we use this um, advanced application example to do some logistic regression and classification using cloud computing. But once you have those models, you also have to think about the evaluation of this model. So is it a good model? Do you have to further iterate on learning the model? And some of the helpers there is visualization in more ways than one. So not only for evaluations with good plots saying the error of the learning goes down, visualization also helps you to understand your data. And we will see that before you usually will use machine learning, um, you have to work usually very much on features for the data. You have to um, actually make data preparation steps, um, data pre-processing as it's called also. And for this visualization is quite an interesting technique to better understand the data before you just go and take some, you know, machine learning model to the cloud. That means really it is not machine learning that says, okay, there's big data, let's throw a machine learning algorithm like support vector machines or decision trees on it and will magically give you all the answers in the world. So this is absolutely not the case. And you will basically learn this even more if you take a proper machine learning course. Now, when it comes to cloud services at the end, we will give you just another example. We also will come back, which is the Amazon SageMaker just for the variety, because we stick here a little bit with the Microsoft Azure platform, which is related to your assignment one. But we will also in subsequent lectures look more in the Amazon web services, which are also very strong tools for machine learning in clouds uh, today. So fasten your seatbelt for interesting moderate introduction for machine learning. And the way we start is the data, right? So here are different words meaning all the same thing, observation of the predictor measurements. This all means you have some form of a vector X where there's input X1 to XD is the dimension of the data. Um, basically you have this vector X and we have Interestingly said in the last lecture, lecture one, we focus in the course a little bit on the supervised learning, right? Supervised in this context means we have always an output for the data, which means if you take the illustration on the bottom right. So when we have, for instance, two classes already of the data, we know it's, you know, this type of flower or that type of flower, or it's a pass and fail of the food inspection. Then we basically have already lots of data that says all the attributes, which is all this long vector X, and I will come to some examples later on. And then I will know, is it the red or the green class? Now, of course, machine learning is there to say something about the new unseen data that you see there in the blue dot. So what is this fellow? We have to analyze it and to this process of analyzing and creating a model for it so that we know is it a red or a green is called classification of new unseen data. And this is by far the best understood machine learning modeling that is existing in machine learning today. So the supervisor is like, basically, you know, like we really teach a supervisor that helps out the learning process by having really an interesting label, as we call it. The output is also called a label, this Y up to N, whereby N usually reflects a number of, you know, samples here. And with this, you basically have then um, the real data that you can use for classification. So, but, before you start, remember also what we said in one of the earlier lectures, um, that basically machine learning always needs three ingredients before you start. And we say like number one, some pattern exists, right? So if there's a random number generator, it doesn't make sense to learn or some random pattern where you believe that doesn't make sense to learn, then we don't go that way. We talked about the physics. So if there's a physical weather prediction formula, which is quite established, there's also a question why we go for machine learning. You can always combine these physics with machine learning. It's called physics informed machine learning, for instance, a very new research track. But normally you would say exact mathematical math formula. If you have this already implemented, then don't go for machine learning, just implement the formula and go ahead, right? 
And the third ingredient is, of course, the most crucial one for machine learning, as a key idea is learning from data. And in our course, it's learning from big data. Although, of course, for the assignments, we break this still down in, in smaller pieces in order to give you all the chance to really work on data. So, and of, of course, keep also the processing time, let's say, to a moderate degree. So the challenges we discussed about, so let's go to some, some practical example, really. So what that all means when I talked about this classes, when I talked about this new unseen data. Here's one example, which is uh, and fills basically all the books in machine learning fundamentals, which means you have to classify a new flower. You see this here on the left side, this interesting uh, colored uh, flowers from Iris Itosa on the right side as well is Iris virginica. And you will see there are groups of data now existing. We know it's different types of the Iris flower. And um, we want to understand if I'm out there in the field taking a snapshot or something, you know, from some flower somewhere in the field and a photo with my iPhone, what type of flower that is, right? So this is something what classification means. And we need to create something which actually make this happen. And exactly this is the purpose of creating a machine learning model. How we can differentiate if this flower is now Iris citosa or Iris virginica. And the question is now, how do I can, can think about this as a learning problem? Because now you would say, if you are a really special, you know, expert in the field, I had just one in the last 10 years teaching this, that could tell that by heart because it was a biologist that actually talked and was an expert in flowers. But usually you have um, some problem as a human just doing this, right? If you look at these flowers now, I'm sure that many of you can't really tell, is this now a Citosa or a Virginica? And now we have to think about something where we can come up with a so-called prediction task and creating a model for it. So that we can just put in some interesting attributes about this flower. And this attribute word is loaded. It reflects two features in the data. What do we have? about this flowers. And so this makes it then an interesting problem. Here's the two class classification problem to say it's this or that flower. So when you now go to the UCI machine learning repository, um, for instance, um, there you find this Iris data set. And this is an interesting repository I encourage you to look in. There's Kaggle, there's, there are different ones, but this is also an interesting one where lots of good examples if you want to do machine learning and they're very nicely prepared already. So here you have an interesting setup of this Iris flower data set that is available to us. It's 150 labeled samples and it's balanced in 50 samples per class. And now immediately to your, to your question comes probably, well, you just said Iris citosa or Iris virginica. So why there's also Iris versicolor? So of course you see it's a three class problem here. So it's actually three different flower types, which are looking very similar. And the other attributes we have is sepal length and sepal width and petal length and petal width. And this is a key idea, and you see that on the picture up there, how to differentiate the flowers. So we have here a pattern underneath this, right? So we believe the pattern is somehow in this petal length and petal width, but we don't know. And we cannot say for sure it's this and that centimeters. And then of course, for um, for the interesting setup in supervised learning, we have already labeled data. So someone already was analyzing this for the iris citosa, iris vesicular, and give labels for it. And so we can take use of it. For the purpose of this class, I subsample here the iris vesicular out, I filter it out. So we will have just 100 samples from iris citosa and, one, uh, and basically also from virginica. So we skip the iris vesicular out of this. And when you now take this data um, and plot it, right? Because if you just take two features, for instance, peta width and peta length are here good examples where we just plotted our whole data set, right? I said it's 50 samples each um, and we have 100 samples. Then you see, okay, there's a pattern. We see already a little bit that, you know, up there seem to be all of one type and down there on the left corner seem to be all on another type. Now the beauty is we just, you know, picked here two attributes of it. So essentially we don't need the other attributes anymore because this pattern could already help 
uh, maybe to differentiate between them. Another beauty aspect is in this data, we have labeled samples, class samples. So we know already that those on top are Iris Hitosa, uh, or basically they are Iris Virginica, or down there is Iris Hitosa. So this is our vector X. So we have 50 samples of this and 50 samples of this, and we can paint them. That's nice. However, it's not machine learning yet, right? What we all have done was data preparation. We make a visualization of the data, plot the data in order to get a better feeling for it. Of course, this ends somehow in three, four dimensions, right? So when you have more and more data, it's in more and more dimensions, then of course, it's not that simple. And that's why machine learning is there. Right, so it, it can also work in higher dimensional spaces, especially if you go to things like kernel tricks and support vector machines and so forth. But coming back to our simple linear separable data problem, what we have here, we have something which is not overlapping in data points. You see that they're very well separated, these groups of data. So we can think about something we call in machine learning a linear decision boundary. Right? Of course, it's a little bit a teaching aspect. So in practice, you will rarely have this linear separable data set. But um, this means if you could draw a line now, right? Um, and you will just decide everything above the line will be automatically irisogenica and everything below the line would be irisitosa. Then you in principle have already some model or some, some handle on this problem. You can say, this is a model that would help me when I just have the new data point coming in, I just measure the peta width, I just measure the peta length, and then I will come somewhere on the plot and it will be above or below this so-called threshold or decision boundary. So this is an interesting aspect. So the separating line, and you will see in much different models, support vector machines, artificial neural networks, they all work, work in one way or another with this interesting decision boundary, but you create them differently. So for a more formal mathematical notation, we say now something what I just explained. If you remember the formula for just you know linear decision boundary here on the right-hand side, we say everything which is above, some certain threshold we don't know yet, right? It's a it's somewhere a linear decision bound somewhere in space. We don't know yet the coefficients. Um, all what we know is the data, right? So the x here is of course constants. They are in your data set. These are the attributes of the flowers, and you have a certain dimensions. So essentially, what we don't know yet is this wi and the threshold. And if you can go on, of course. Um, you will see that we can use this WI, this kind of um, weight as we call it, to steer the line. So we can actually move it around. And this is of course something where now machine learning takes place to move these line to a real good position. Um, for mathematical convenience, we also yes, pick here a little bit more a mathematical notation of saying everything which is plus one is Iris Virginica and everything is minus one is Iris Citosa. Because we have, you know, have to learn the threshold and the WI anyway, um, this is of course something where um, machine learning takes place and I show you in next um, slides how that works. But essentially we could take the sine function, which is nothing else of saying it's plus one or minus one if you have a very um, compact notation now in math. Now, looking on this a little bit more um, from a history perspective, this is something what was invented 1957 by a gentleman called Rosenblatt. And it's the first real machine learning model where people talk about. So it's interestingly enough, getting lots of new, um, let's say momentum, because it's a key ingredient, if you will, partly in deep learning. Because the idea was that you basically have a machine learning model that is acting like neurons in the brain. And deep learning is taking advantage of this as well, of having lots of interconnected neurons, so to speak, but of course on a much higher scale. But in the 50s, and if you download the paper, it's also in the, in the canvas, it's quite interesting. And you see this model can work on the data. It has the possibility to take what we just described and learn from it. So if you see the sign is something called, you know, the activation function later than in big deep learning networks here, it's just the sign. And we have a certain signal that's coming in from the training data, which is always XI, which is essentially all what you have within the vector, all the different training samples. And you can play around with them uh, up to a certain dimension, which was now example two. 
And the threshold is modeled on the right hand side. If you see that a little bit with a perceptron uh, model, it's really as a bias, always going into one of these nodes as they are called. So the X is a constant always flowing in and the Y on the right hand side that we can compare if it's really true is also something we have. If you remember the label that makes it so nice in supervised learning, right? And we can put always a linear sum that you see in the formula, basically taking all the different X's and the weights and then come put it through this activation side function, which in our case here is just the sign and compare, is it really plus one or minus one? Now, of course, a crucial aspect is now how the heck we go to the W's, right? You will notice this is something we have to learn. It's a called weights in machine learning. It's a kind of model of the human brain. We learn with the strengths of neural connections in the brain. So we will learn and by iterative learning, it gets stronger and strong and the weight will be stronger and stronger. So how we do this, how we learn this, we have now a model, how we abstract from this, let's say mathematical formula to some real model. And we know how to fill it, but now we need some mechanism, some algorithm really, to learn these Ws, right? And of course the bias, which is sometimes W0 or the bias X0 uh, automatically always added. So here's a good example of a Boolean function, um, for instance, which um, you see on the left-hand side. Just if you basically try it out and pick some of the examples, you will see if you put that in, um, let's say one, uh, if you see there, you just put from the table, the X1, X2, X3 is inside these models. And let's say you would have already a learning algorithm that puts out 0 0.3 for all weights and the bias is 0 0.4. Then you can quickly, by just putting in the all these eight, um, and I picked here two examples on the bottom, you can see it works, right? So, but this is of course a trained perceptron model. So we know already the weights, and this is in the beginning, of course, not clear. So we need a certain training phase that is working on this training data in order to find these weights. And of course, we have lots of data available, and it will be crucial how to cut it into training and test data later. But we have some data available that we can use um, to learn from. And you see there, if you just stick it in and then you take the sign, you will see that the sum is positive, 0 0.2, then you take the sign from it, which is plus. And if the negatives, uh, basically, then you just take the sign, which is minus one or minus. So of course, a very trivial algorithm, a very simple one, but it has, let's say, it will always still converge if you have linear separable data sets. And this is quite interesting when you look that it's also a very old learning algorithm. So another visual imp uh, implementation of this is what you see there down there, saying that the decision boundary also creates a certain decision space, right? You see the green space is one class and the blue space is another. And all of the new data sets that lie in this or that space will be classified as either plus one or minus one. In our example, uh, Zetosa or Virginica. Now you can see that this algorithm that we're going to search is a certain hypothesis. So, um, and two of them below are both correct, right? You see, they actually try, separate the data quite well. There's zero error. Um, blue in the blue region, green in the green region. So this is a quite nice thing. Of course, this also gives you perspective that a learning algorithm can always take the samples and see are they really correctly um, you know, classified. And it will go step by step iterative through all these points and always use them and compare the label that is there, which reflects the color, right? So essentially learning means, machine learning means uh, that you play around with this line. And by adjusting the red elements, you're adjusting this line and make it ever better and better to basically get all the samples correct. Now, all the samples is a loaded word. It works for the perceptron. If there's linear separable data, if not, you're in trouble. Then you need another algorithm. We cannot talk in this lecture today called, for instance, support vector machines that allow some error to happen, for instance, um, but thinking about the greater good, uh, but it's a more sophisticated machine learning model. And I would like to stay a little bit at the, let's say, simpler model to grasp what machine learning is. Now for this, we do a little bit more compact annotation, but it's really for those of you who are in math and um, did some math lectures, should be you know, very clear to, to you know, basically see that. And um, 
see the small steps we do there. We firstly take the threshold and call it W0. As we learn it, we always can define that our first X0 will be one because we can adjust it to W0 in the learning process. So that is already compactor on the left, as you see. Um, there's this interesting notation transpose, which is let very mathematical, but in the end, just vector notation of doing uh, something which leads in the end down there, you see to the dot product, right? So your W transpose X would be just saying, you take the dot product from W and your vector X. And both are vectors then, um, meaning that we have to find those vector W in the learning process. And all of these notations are different, uh, are not different, but you know, differently used in all the books. You will find some using transpose notation, some dot product notation, but in the end you see here all of them mean more or less the same. So when we think now what is the steps we do, the algorithm, uh, that is what's really interesting in this perceptual learning algorithm. It's a very simple algorithm, very um, easy. It just picks always the next point, right? One misclassified training point at the time and can just transfer it because you always have your current W, you have to initialize this with some value of all the Ws. And then you essentially say W transpose X, go through all the vectors, you put it through the sign, it's a linear combination. And then basically what you have is you compare it with your label. And if the sign is plus one or minus one, you can decide now, is it correct or is it not correct? And so this means we need to update the weight vector and this is done by just, interestingly enough, adding the sign, right? So you see here what it means when you have a vector notation, you can nicely also visualize this. It's like just adding a vector or subtracting a vector. You know, if y is n, y is minus one or y is plus one. Now, the interesting thing is really, if you play that along one, step one, step two, step one, step two, go through all your data set and it's linearly separate, then actually it will converges that you see on the right hand side very nicely in this in this video, right? So it is a very hectic algorithm, right? There are much more smooth algorithms based on optimization methods. Here you have just add vector, subtract vector. That's why it's hopping so much around. But the interesting thing is the longer you wait with the iterations of the data, you will find this spot, which is no data point is misclassified. And this is already the breakthrough that has been done very early on in machine learning, right? So this is really the perceptron, one of the most simplest learning algorithms you have in machine learning today. And now if you stick that to our ERIS flower classification task, it works nicely. So you basically can take the same data, put it in, uh, because you have the label, you will go through all these vectors, it will hop around and it eventually will then converge with one of these lines, which will be then our decision boundary. <clears throat> this might be not the best decision boundary. There are other methods like support vector machines that try to support the best line if possible or, or so, but at least it does a job and we have something and it's a model that we can take to now take future data and actually think about it. And, you know, we have a model where we just can stick in a new data point. We don't know the label yet for the new unseen data, but we can figure it out by just putting it into the model and it will give us, it is a minus one or plus one. And with this, we know for certain it's a, basically an iris from that type or another type. So let's summarize a little bit going towards the at end of the first part of the lecture. So machine learning models are there. There are many different algorithms. We had the perceptron model and there's a perceptron learning algorithm we have seen with the vectors. There are support vector machines and there's program, quadratic programming as the algorithm training it. There's uh, basically neural networks and there's back propagation algorithms to train them. So there's always a model that goes with some algorithm. And these algorithms of course are here and they're also tuned or um, basically in different varieties existing. Then basically you have labeled data set, especially now of course in the supervised learning, in unsupervised learning, a different learning type that you don't have a guiding label. It's much more harder, especially if you're of overlapping samples, it's very hard to, to really get the idea of different classes, but that's not our concern here. Here we have labeled data, we have samples we can learn from. And in a crucial aspect that you also should take away from this lecture is that learning is not memorizing. We don't want to have a system which is just working well for the things we have in sample, 
we want to have something which works also very well for out of sample. And this is a meaning that is very important in machine learning, uh, not just explaining the data, but we want to have future points right. And this reflects also how we establish decision boundaries and so forth. When we think about now the data set, um, we had a training set so far, it's a bit new now that you see on the top right. We took all of the data points, but we just usually train on some of them and actually put some of them, others, away for test. So essentially you break your examples into two parts, which is a training set and a test set. And advanced uh, people here on the call that maybe know a little bit about machine learning, there's even more, you can have validation sets for model decision. So you would put away more data. But in our course lecture here, we would say we have a training and a test set, which then is basically used to firstly train your model. And as we see in the second part of the lecture, also to evaluate your model more on the test set. Um, there's no real, basically a separation rule. Some rule of thumb is often if you're swimming in data, just put 10% for training, 90% for test. Um, but of course it depends on how much samples you really have. Maybe 10% is not much. So then you have to take more data. And this is of course something which in big learning sounds very nice, but there's also lots of noise in the data and big data. So it's not always high quality data just because it's big data. Let us come to the example that um, some of you already know, of course. So the food inspection in Chicago is interesting. Um, we, th we thought when there are lots of qual quality problems in a restaurant checking. So if you have lots of violations in this, you will see that if there's some food inspection coming regularly, which in the US is also very much the case and uh, basically all around Europe, and then you basically have an indicator. So will we really pass or fail? Now, the interesting thing is that this is a pattern and we think there's no real mathematical formula for it. So um, let's go ahead and implement it. And the interesting thing is we have again, data from the city of Chicago available that was doing some food inspections and has all the violations as texts. So this is something what we will learn from, right? Like you have also in the assignment. Now, the, the interesting thing is that here linear classification is not really uh, very sophisticated anymore, losing the perceptron algorithm. So we will go to some form of a regression model. Regression is nothing very, let's say, uh, tough. It's a real valued function. That's the only, uh, let's say, point in saying it's a regression problem. And of course, given that, you know, restaurants is perhaps a really non-linear aspect in learning in the patterns, we cannot stick with a complete linear regression model it's rather logistic regression what we're gonna use. And the idea of a logistic function or sigmoid function is really to squash everything between zero and one. And the only difference essentially, we, it's a little bit very similar like what you have seen with the perceptron. And the only difference is once we get essentially the, the weights transpose X out of this model we learned, we put it through another function, a nonlinear function, as you see here, the sigmoid function, also called logistic function. And with this brings everything between zero and one. It's well defined, it's a one over one plus E to the minus Z, essentially. And this is your, your logistic function. And if you do so, you use a certain um, optimization uh, method really to go iteratively through the data, check it every time. If you have a pass and fail of your candidates in order to you know, build this machine learning model to have the weights basically updated. The way how you exactly update the weights will be coming more in lecture three and lecture six will also talk about in this method called stochastic gradient descent. So this would be a bit too technical here for the lecture, also for the sake of the time. But I brought you a video and I would encourage you to look at it, not necessarily because they talk about Pokemon, which is perhaps a bit old, but they have an interesting way of showing how this logistic regression works. However, as I said, it's not a deep machine learning course we have here. Um, it's okay to capture roughly the, the idea of logistic regression. That's all for the first part of the lecture. So we see us again in 10 minutes.